Welcome. I'm shorter than whoever set this up. I hope you can hear me. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you all for coming out on what appears to be the first taste of spring. Uh, it's a wonderful day, uh, but it's very nice to see you all here. I'm Lynette Clementson. I'm the director of Wallace House here at the University of Michigan. Um, many of you know us. For those of you who don't, we run two programs here at the university. The Knight Wallace Fellowships for Journalists, which is a residential program here at the university. We bring 18 to 20 accomplished journalists from around the world here to the university every year to pursue studies that strengthen their work as journalists and enable them to get back out into the field um, stronger, refreshed, with more skills. And uh, the university opens its doors to our journalists every year. And so we're deeply thankful for the resources that we have here and the university's belief in journalism and the role of journalism in society and enabling us to make a home on this campus for journalists so that they can do their best work in the world in a time when it's, it's sorely needed. Our other program is the Livingston Awards for Young Journalists, which is an annual prize. Um, we have the Livingston Awards every year in June in New York, and we give three prizes for excellence in journalism, one for local reporting, one for national reporting, and one for international reporting. We also recognize an experienced journalist who uh, has done exceptional mentorship for young journalists with the Clerman Prize. And in the journalism world, people recognize the Livingstons, and the shorthand for the Livingstons is the Pulitzers for the Young. But between those two programs, Wallace House here at the University of Michigan is really um, enabling strength and growth along the arc of journalists' careers in their early career when they need a boost and they need their work to be recognized, and in the middle of their career once they're established to enable them to keep going. And so we're very happy to be able to do that work. The room now, today, is filled with this year's Knight Wallace Fellows. If you could just raise your hands. Hopefully you'll get to meet some of our fellows after the program. Uh, and then the third thing, our third program from Wallace House is the thing that brings us all here today, Wallace House Presents. Wallace House Presents is our public events program. We believe even though we do amazing things in Wallace House, and Wallace House is indeed a physical structure on Oxford Road um, that some of you have been to and others I would invite you to come. Wallace House is a place and it is a place where journalists convene, but we believe that today it's crucially important to take the work of journalists and move people up out of their phones and their tablets and their laptops into public spaces like this to talk about the work that journalists do, the way they do their work, the stories and the issues they write about, and the role of journalism in society. And so Wallace House Presents enables us to gather people on this campus and around the country, and that's what brings us here today. We also believe in collaboration with units across campus. And I would like to thank uh, the parts of the university that helped us put this together today. This event today is co-sponsored by Iranian Studies, Global Islamic Studies, and the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies. We're also live streaming this event so that people can participate um, from wherever they are. And Detroit Public Television is carrying this event today as well. I got the email from them. They sent it out to about 25,000 people. And uh, so we trust that many people will be engaged in the discussion here today. And we're going to make room for them when we open it up to Q&A not just to you and asking you to come to the microphones we have in the aisles, but also to those who are watching us via live stream to participate via Twitter. You can join the conversation, even those of you in the room who would rather not stand up, using the hashtag Wallace House. We'll have our fellows um, monitoring Twitter. We'll make sure that your questions get asked, and we'd like to bring everyone into the conversation. So today, what brings us here is an extraordinary story, an extraordinary saga of one journalist, 
But the reason it's important is because it brings light to the freedom and safety of all journalists around the world. And press safety has always been something that has been an issue in the past several years. Uh, the danger to journalists around the world and even here in the United States um, has increased. And part of our role at Wallace House is to not just shine a light on the work of journalists, but really to speak out for the need for press freedom and the safety of journalists around the world. Um, and so we're honored to have Jason Rezaian here with us today. Jason uh, is a reporter for the Washington Post, and he was the newspaper's Tehran bureau chief from 2012 to 2016. And I don't know, we're gonna have a book signing after the event. This is what brings us here today, this book, Prisoner, that details uh, his time in captivity in Iran, having been charged with being a spy. Uh, and it's an extraordinary book, not simply because it's about one man's saga in prison, but because the book takes on so much more. It is a book about generations of families between countries. It is a book about relationships between states and how things get done behind the scenes. It is a book about how countries value their citizens and what they're willing to do or not do to keep them safe. Um, and even though the title, the, the, the subject matter is grim, there's, there's no getting around the fact that being in prison for 544 days uh, is tough material. The thing that I loved about this book is that Jason is such a wonderful writer that the book also manages to be breezy and entertaining, which are words that I would never think I would apply to a book like this. It's quite a page turner, uh, and I hope that you'll all stay after the event to meet Jason, to buy a book, and have him sign it for you. And because we want these events to be conversations, um, and we want you all to be involved, I've invited someone here to join us today to engage Jason in a conversation about his story and about the book. Our special guest today joining Jason is Bill, McLaren, but Bill McCarran. He is executive director of the National Press Club in DC. Um, and Bill is a friend of mine and a lion of a man who fights every day to make sure that people understand the role of the press and what happens when we take the role of the press for granted. Um, Bill and his colleagues at the National Press Club fought tirelessly for Jason's release, uh, even at one point holding a readathon where they read Jason's work for 24 hours in shifts with reporters coming and reading for an hour or two and passing it on to another reporter. Um, and they made sure that Jason's name stayed in the news and that his story stayed in the news and that pressure stayed on um, the officials who needed to take getting him out of prison seriously. Uh, so I'd like to welcome to the stage Bill McCarran and Jason Rezaian. Thank you very much. Do you want this one? Do that one. Huh? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go sit down and I'm going to come back up when we open it up for questions in the end, so I can actually enjoy hearing them speak. Hey, thank you, Lynette, and thanks to all your amazing staff at the Knight Wallace House. We've so enjoyed being with them just today for, for a, a great time. Yeah. Jason. Hello. Hi, Bill. And, uh, <laughs> congratulations on this really, really amazing book. And uh, Lynette said it very well. Um, yeah, I think it, it, will, it will change what you think about the region, it will change what you think about Iran, it will change what you think about journalism, uh, it will entertain you, and for $19 on Amazon, that's, <laughs> that's, that's pretty, pretty great. If I accomplished two or three of those things that you just listed, I'd be happy, but uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. It's my first time in Ann Arbor. 
So um, thanks for having me. Jason, thanks everybody uh, for coming out today. There's a traditional greeting in Ann Arbor. Uh, do you know that? Go greeting? blue, is that right? <laughs> Go blue. Go blue. I, I did know that. So um, one, of, one of the things that Jason says in the book about, uh, about himself is that it's, it's never as comfortable for him uh, as he makes it look. And um, he's, he's been through a lot and he does an amazing job to do events like this. But we wanted to start by making him comfortable if we could. So in the spirit of Go Blue, one thing you should know about Jason, he's an amazing sports fan. And we want to talk about sports for a couple of minutes before we get into other things, just to sort of... Lighten the mood a little bit? Yeah, chill, right. chill out. Bring it down and then bring it back up. There you go. Right. So um, you're a big basketball fan. I'm a fan of the Golden State Warriors. And before everybody um, says, well, who's not a fan of the Golden State Warriors? I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I was born and raised out there and um, was going to Warriors games since the 1980s and through the 1990s when we were the worst team in the NBA. So when I learned um, about 11 months into my imprisonment that the Warriors had won the NBA Finals for the first time in my life, um, I was more pissed off that day <laughs> than I had been in the previous 300 and something days. It sounds... It sounds like a small thing, but this is a big fan, right? So, Well, you know, I think that that's part of the, um, what you forget about um, when you're imprisoned, when you're taken off the, uh, the streets, as it were, um, life keeps happening. Right? I, 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 people ask me about 2015. I said, that's, don't ask me about 2015. I spent the first day and the last day and every day in between uh, behind bars. Um, I, I, I can't relate to your stories of what happened that year. And um, I'm glad that, that my experience ended after 544 days. At the same time, it should never happen in the first place. Right. Uh, but I realized that it could have been much worse uh, and that's what's made it possible for me to, to maybe laugh about some of these things now um, and, and try and turn it into a story that I hope uh, not only that, that people who've never been to prison can relate to, uh, but that, that teaches something about, uh, about that part of the world, about journalism. Um, and as I was saying earlier today to the Knight Wallace fellows, you don't get a chance to tell them your own story very often. Right? Um, it's not every day that people come a calling and say, you know, write your memoir. So I figure I'd pack it with as much me as I could. And there's a lot in there, and a lot about your family, and it's a, it's a great read. So with the last sports story I wanted to have, and then we'll go on to something else, is that uh, when you come back, you're, you're also a, a big Oakland A's fan, mm. and you're, you're invited by the A's to throw out the opening day pitch in 2016. So what does that look like? I, um, I played baseball like probably many of you did um, from the time I was uh, eight or nine all the way through high school. And I wasn't the, the best player on the team. I probably wasn't the worst player on the team either. Uh, but the one thing that's for certain, that at 40 years old, uh, two months out of prison on the other side of the world, uh, the, the idea of picking up a baseball uh, in front of thousands of people and throwing it 60 feet, six inches uh, was scary. Yeah. Uh, Practice in the backyard. I pra so I practiced <laughs> with my best friend, Ryan Hall. Uh, I, I, we were living in, in the Bay Area, my wife and I, after we were released, and we spent uh, a lot of afternoons, Ryan and me, you know, with the tape measure, making mm. sure we had the yeah. correct distance. Yeah. And he told me, when you go there, the groundskeeper is not going to let you get up on the mound, right? Um, yep. So we're going we're gonna to go five or six inches in front of that. Um, so we'll, we'll do it about 60 uh, feet without the six inches. And the day I'm there at the Coliseum, I ask the groundskeeper. And he says, uh, no, 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 no. You, can, you just came out of prison. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I get up on, on the hill, and there's a reason they call it the hill. It's 18 inches high. You don't realize that when you're looking at it on TV. So um, I got up there, and I will say, uh, and the record is out there uh, to prove it, I threw a strike. <laughs> it didn't bounce. Um, it was kind of a rainbow, right? And it, you know, I think it probably would have gotten knocked out of the park. Uh, if somebody was there to, to take a crack at it. But anyway, yes. Well, many, many welcome home moments for you. Yeah. But throwing out the first pitch at a baseball game, that's, that's a welcome home moment. Yeah, it was, it was um, one of many things that happened in those first few months that uh, helped to undo a lot of the bit bitterness that I guess you want to talk about. Yeah, I do. <laughs> if you will. I and, will. Uh, I'm here. So, you're... Uh, you're the Washington Post's Tehran bureau chief. Yeah. You're married to a wonderful Iranian woman. Her mom's getting ready to have a birthday party. You're getting dressed up and you're going to go. And you get into the elevator at your building and what happens? So this is July 22nd of 2014. My wife and I uh, have been married for 15 months at that point. And um, we're both journalists, both working for foreign media outlets um, in Iran. Um, we were getting ready to come to the United States. We had just received approval uh, from my wife's green card. You know, you can do all of that work from abroad. And uh, we were to travel to to San Francisco, where I'm from, on Friday. This was Tuesday night. Yeah. So we were getting ready to go to this birthday party uh, and uh, went down the elevator into our garage. And as the door opened, there was a man standing there with a gun pointed right at my face. Uh, and he said my name. <laughs> and uh, I thought about saying no. No, that's not me. <laughs> uh, that's the guy in the next elevator. Uh, but you know, you're shocked. You don't know mm -hmm. what to do. And um, he very quickly kind of put his foot in front of the elevator door, uh, jammed his way in with two other people, two other men. Uh, they took our cell phones away from us, took us back up to our apartment, uh, forced their way into the apartment, separated my wife and I, and began to ransack our, our house. Um, I had no idea what was going on. Um, for those who um, have spent time in authoritarian countries, uh, or Iran specifically, you've heard stories about things like this. You've probably maybe even known people who it's happened to. Uh, but until it happens to you, uh, it, it's a very confusing uh, situation with no ready answers, uh, and no one to answer the questions that are racing through your mind. Um, very quickly, our home was filled with plainclothes security agents, all of them wearing surgical masks to hide their identity. Um, and each was carrying either a gun or a video camera filming the contents of our house, filming my wife and I at close angles, um, going through all of our possessions, right down to uh, the tea bags in our cupboard, cutting those open. Uh, it was a, a, the strangest experience of my life. I had no idea what they were looking for. And frankly, I didn't have anything to hide. So, you know, I told my wife, just let them do what they're gonna do this will all blow over quickly. And um, after about an hour and a half, uh, they said, okay, it's time to go. Uh, at this point, they've already seized our, our laptops, our cell phones, made us relinquish our uh, passwords. You might think to yourself, well, I would never do something like that. Um, I would argue that you probably would uh, in, in those circumstances. Um, our passports, our, all of our documents, our identity documents. And in a country like that, 
When you have your passport, your driver's license, your identity card taken from you, you are nobody. And even if we were set free that night, going to try and reestablish our identities uh, would be next to impossible. We were then uh, taken out of our apartment through the courtyard of our building. We lived in a high rise where there was two twin towers and a big fountain in the middle. And this was during Ramadan at the end of the day when people were about to break their fast. So families are gathering, friends are greeting each other. Um, and we were kind of put through what I call a walk of shame, you know, paraded by, um, by our neighbors. And again, for people that know that part of the world, um, our neighbors knew exactly what was happening. Um, they didn't know the circumstances, but they know that we were being led away uh, to an uncertain fate. We were put in the back of a van. Uh, we were blindfolded, handcuffed, and taken to prison. Um, and I had no, no way of knowing that that was the beginning of a year and a half ordeal that would, um, that would change our lives in every way, uh, but also become the incredible saga and story um, that it became. I mean, it's amazing. It's an amazing story. And, and you, you're in prison, Yegi's in prison, and you're separated. Yeah. And you, you, you don't know where she is. You don't know what's happening with her. For about the first, the first night that we were taken into to the prison, we were in the same room for about two minutes. I was blindfolded. She was not. We had been separated for an hour. And she came back in the room and said, you're not in prison clothes. I'm in prison clothes. Why aren't you in prison clothes? Uh, and um, it, was, it was jarring, scary, all of those things. And before I could even answer, she was muffled and taken away. Um, and that began a process of uh, inten intense interrogation and solitary confinement. My life uh, for the next seven weeks was the interrogation room or my cell. And my cell was uh, about four and a half feet by eight and a half feet. I could lay down in one direction and not the other. Um, I had a, a hole in the ground uh, as a toilet, which is common in that part of the world. I mean, frankly, in, in many homes, that's uh, what a toilet is. But uh, Mine was the breeding ground for all sorts of nasty um, pests. The lights were on 24 hours a day uh, in my cell, artificial lighting. Um, I don't want anybody to do anything about this, but you know, I'm still, still very sensitive yeah. to light and probably always will be. I mean, it's over three years now since I've been released, but lights bother me uh, because for the entire year and a half I was in prison, the lights were on. Um, now, there's a, now you can't see the sky or you can't see outside. No, no, there's, there's no knowing about uh, what's going on beyond that tiny little world of your cell. Uh, and it gets to the point where when you're taken to, sol to out of solitary confinement for interrogation, you are anticipating in a good way this human contact that you have, even if it's designed to, um, to destroy you. My wife was going through the same thing. I did not know that. I could not have known her whereabouts. I think ultimately, um, most of that time, we were probably less than 100 feet apart from each other. Mm -hmm. But we were never in the same place at the same time. On the 35th day, they, um, they gave us the opportunity to, to see each other for about four minutes. And I, I think that that was probably the happiest moment in my life because it, um, all of my worst fears were proven not to be founded, mm -hmm. right? True. Yeah. All of the things that I imagined that they might have done to her hadn't happened. Um, but then after a four-minute meeting, I was put back in my solitary cell, and so was she. 
so that, that was my experience for, for the first several months of my imprisonment. Thank you for sharing that, Jason. I think uh, we should get something out of the way that I've heard you talk about before. Uh, friends of yours are um, happy when we read that while you were, in our view, tortured, the, the physical aspects that, that we connote when we think about that were not really present. Do you want to explain yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I've never um, contended that, I, that a finger was ever laid on me. It wasn't. Um, but the, the psychological torture, uh, first of solitary confinement, uh, and I've become a, a vocal um, and repetitive advocate for outlawing and, and, and banishing solitary confinement as a practice the world over because I think um, there's nothing just or humane about it. Um, the scars of that on your psyche uh, begin to amass almost immediately. You know, within the first couple of days, the, the combination of com confusion, fear, um, and, and just the primal urge to be around others of your own species uh, sets in almost immediately. Uh, and you essentially feel like a caged animal. And it's designed to make you feel that way. It's designed to make you feel subhuman. And it works. Um, so you were glad, in a way, to s see the door opening. Yeah. And you know, it's like a game of, uh, of Russian roulette almost every time the door opens, because you don't know what you're going to get. You know, interrogators, uh, some days they're playing good cop, some days they're playing bad cop. Some days they tell you that you're going to be released within a matter of hours. Some days they tell you that within a matter of hours you're going to be hung. Uh, and so that was the, the ritual. Um, and it got to the point where it took me about eight or nine months to really get this mantra in my mind. Whatever they say, believe the opposite. Whatever they tell you to do, do the opposite. Uh, and that, that was how I ordered my, myself in there. You have to keep multiple sets of mental books when you're in a situation like that. Um, and the one that was sort of the underpinning of the whole thing was, one, I love my wife very much, and I want to have our life back. And two, I didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And just held on to those two things. And um, um, fortunately, we're here now to tell about it. Sure. Now, you were, uh, you were accused of, of being a spy mm. in, in interrogation, and then later in a, in a trial. And I, if, there are any, if there are any people from the University of Michigan Fine Law School, you can just set aside what I'm saying when I say the word trial. Um, in, your, in your defense, was, was stated well in the Farsi language press and also in your book that everything that you did, you did as a journalist and that everything you did was legal. And that's what you stuck to. And what I wanted to say and ask you is that you're not the first journalist to be held in prison in Iran, and you won't be the last, unfortunately. But there seemed to be a pattern where journalists could be released if they would state that the charge was real, even though it seemed like no one believed the charge was right. real. You didn't do that. You, you stood your ground. And uh, I'm part of the journalism community, so as a journalist, I was, I was incredibly proud that you would do that because you upheld journalism. But I think, and I'd like to ask you this, after reading your book, I think you did it in part also for the Iran 
that you love, not the government, but the country and the people. Is there anything in there that you want to? Yeah, I mean, look, I think in the process of being interrogated, um, I, I hope nobody in the audience has ever gone through a, a prolonged series of interrogations. But if you have, you probably can relate to what I'm about to say. Um, when you're subjected to something like that, you sort of very quickly get to a state where you want to tell people what they want to hear so that you can win some tiny concession. Whether it's 10 more minutes of fresh air uh, or uh, a bag of peanuts or um, the, the, the false promise that they're going to let you see your wife. Mm -hmm. um, so you become malleable. And um, you admit to things, potentially, uh, that aren't true. Um, and all they were trying to get me to do, and all that I ever refused to do, was to say or write down that I was spying for the American government. They couldn't get me to do it. But that's they, what they wanted you to they do. They wanted me to do it. They, you know, they could get me to say, you know, my, my, mm, my articles in the Washington Post are criminal because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, based on what you are telling me, I apparently have committed a crime. And then they would take those papers and tear them up and say, do it again. Take out the apparently. Take out the supposedly. You must say, I am a criminal and I, I'm asking for forgiveness. I wouldn't do it. And then when I got on trial, um, when I was taken out of the walls of the prison, I understood that this is my only opportunity to uh, defend myself outside of the vacuum of that prison. And even if I know that the result is gonna be a guilty verdict, I gotta stand my ground. The last thing that I want is to be the guy uh, who's, you know, the headline says, resign, pleads guilty. Even if the next, you know, the subtitle is sentence commuted, goes home. Because my wife was like, I'm not going to stand for that. I don't want the husband who, that, who, uh, who is giving in to these people in that way. And to your point about previous journalists and others um, pleading guilty and then being released, we've all heard of examples of that in Iran, in China, yeah. uh, in North Korea. But we've also heard of examples of people who don't come home. Yeah. And um, Yegi and I talked about it, and I said to her, I said, you know, this might mean that I'm gonna stay here longer. Mm -hmm. uh, but she said, but it means that at some point you will come home. Yeah. Yegi, and it was a gamble. I mean, we took that gamble. Yegi's an incredibly powerful, proud, feisty, committed person. And uh, even though they were, you all were separated, in a very real sense, she was with you mm. through all these decisions, right? And she almost, she was kept in solitary confinement for 72 nights, uh, her, the entire time that she was in prison. And um, on the day that they told her that she was going home, she said she didn't want to leave. Uh, with you. I want to I wait until my husband is released. And I wasn't there at that moment, but she tells the story of it, and my, and my captors, told me about it as well. It's, you know, they said, we laughed at her. You know, you're the first person that didn't want to go home. <laughs> yeah. um, that's my wife. And she did in the worst way, but she wanted to go with you. Um, and, and these stories are amazing, and the way you're telling them are amazing, but the book and the words in the book for a, for a group that probably spends their life reading, that's a very special experience. And I wondered if you'd read a little bit for us that passage you and I were talking about? Yeah, set the stage and I'll be happy to do it. Sure, so Jason said when he leaves the prison and goes to trial, right, some things happen in his life. Um, and in this, in this scene, um, he's leaving the prison to go to, to, go to the trial. And um, it's, been a, it's been a while since, uh, well, I'm not gonna, that would give it away. Uh, it's, um, it's about his trip, and it's about 
what he uh, experiences on that trip, both in sound and in a little bit of sight, and it's, uh, it's beautifully told. So uh, there's an audio version of this book, which my wife listened to. I thought Jason was, she was talking to Jason on the phone because I'd come into a room and I'd hear his voice. He reads on the audio version, and I think it's, it's amazing. So I, I wanted to ask him to read some today. Why don't you start there? Okay. Yeah. So this is the 42nd day that I'm in prison, and um, the first time that, um, that I'm about to leave it. I was back on a dirt road. I thought I recognized the slope from the night we were hauled in. I was flanked on either side by men who didn't talk and held me by my arms. They were forceful, but remained calm, which made the situation which made the situation feel all the more sinister. It was nothing like I'd imagined hostage scenes to be, chaotic and filled with threats against a struggling victim. They had done this before, often. And what, I was gonna re and, and what was I gonna rebel against? They guided me into the back of a van, to the seat directly behind the drivers. A guy sat next to me and another behind me. He put his hand on my shoulder as if to say, I'm here. Underneath a corner of my blindfold, I could see a flap of black cloth draping toward the floor, which was almost certainly a chador, the all-encompassing sheet worn by many pious Iranian women. Behind the woman, I could hear someone else breathing and feel the anxiety she brought with her. It was another woman, but I had no way of knowing who. We weren't allowed to talk. I had to know if it was Yegi. When all the doors were closed and the engine was turned on, I said, Salam, offering greetings to whoever was there, knowing someone had to answer. That's customary. She let out a tiny cry, and I knew then that I was with my wife. I kept talking, and the driver, the same bastard who drove us to prison that first night, told me I needed to stop. She's my wife, I responded. You'll have time to talk to her when we get there, he responded. I wasn't sure whether I could trust this or not, but I did as I was told. Yegi cried behind me again. And for the first time in the five years we were together, she, she began reciting prayers. After 20 minutes at high speeds on a highway headed mostly downhill, we began to wind around the hectic mid-morning traffic of central Tehran. Out the tinted window, I saw a silly little train on wheels ferrying passengers around carless roads. We were approaching Tehran's bazaar. I'd spent so much time over the years there, from my first visit to Iran in 2001 to all the times I guided foreign visitors through the tiny covered alleys of rug shops and the various restaurants in and around the ancient shopping mall. I went there to work on stories and just for fun. It was one of my favorite parts of Tehran. It made Istanbul's Grand Bazaar feel like a Disney version of a Middle Eastern souk. There was no map or television screens announcing the local weather, or international news headlines, or currency exchange rates. It was all grit and commerce, and I loved it. And, and as we pulled up that morning, I understood the odds of my ever seeing it again as a free man were slipping away, and there was nothing I could do about it. Thank you. So it's a page turner, and it's a memoir, but it's, it's literature. And the part about seeing under the blindfold and being able to get just a little glimpse of what's in that van, the, and then, it, then it's, it's Yegi, this is something you could find in, in, in Dickens if you change the setting. And, and the part about going through the sook and and the life of it, and to, and to never see it again, and the streets as we're going through the town, this is something you could, you could find in, you know, in joys. And uh, I'm really just delighted with the story and the words, even though I know I'm not supposed to be, because it's about something really horrible that happened to my friend. Um, but thank you for reading that. Sure, thank you.
Yeah. Um, I did want to ask you a few questions about the book and some things that happen in the book, and maybe you can share with us more about that. So at some point, you state that you had privileges removed because someone caught you or you were discovered passing a note to Yegi when she was out of prison and she was going to take that note with her somewhere and you got caught. And uh, my question, and then you say that you'd succeeded three different times. So my question is, what was the, what was the mechanism for the note transmission? What did it say and who was it going to? <laughs> so we learned pretty quickly that every move that we made was surveilled. There were cameras in our cells. Um, there were cameras in the room that uh, Yegi and I would have um, our visits in when she was released from prison. Um, after we came out of solitary confinement, I was put into uh, a larger cell with a gentleman who'd been there for several years. And um, I, I'm sure it's like this er anywhere in the world, but if, if somebody's been in prison for a while, um, they start to collect things. Right. You start to collect whatever you can get your hands on because uh, it might be useful for you at some point. So he had um, collected various pens. Mm. Um, and we didn't really have uh, paper. We weren't supposed to have paper. Uh, but he had little scraps of paper um, from a calendar because he'd been there for three years and, you know, he, he would threatened to go on hunger strike, and then they would say, okay, you can have a digital clock. I mean, you know, it's just, it's a, a crazy thing that you end up um, having very petty desires. So I, I took a piece of his paper one day and wrote kind of a letter to my mom and my brother, mm -hmm. asking them to do more publicly, because I didn't think that there was enough going on. And um, Yegi came to the to meeting that we had, and she was wearing this, you know, what they call the chador that I mentioned in that passage, which is like, literally, it means tent. It's a, you know, a, a cover for women. And she's, you know, a young woman who wears Western clothes, but, you know, she was wearing a chador for that year or so that I was still in prison because uh, it was, made it easier for her to get into places like the prison or the court or whatever. So I, I, I bundled up this little um, note and put it in the side of my, my prison pants, which were like pajamas with an elastic waist. And uh, when she showed up, she you know, would hug me, right? And there's a camera on there. Uh, so in that embrace, I said to her, there's a little note in, there's a little note in the side <laughs> of my book. And it worked. And then the next week it worked again. Um, and I was getting more and more cavalier with the messages that I was trying to get out. You know, please contact this person, please contact that person, um, whatever I could do. And um, I've had, since I've been released, uh, other prisoners who are still in that prison, letters from them have gotten to me. It's incredible. Um, but one day on the fourth try, um, I think a guard was paying more attention than usual to the surveillance camera. Um, and, um, and he caught me. And then Yegi tried to apparently eat the, uh, eat the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> but she, she's not a fast chewer. <laughs> and, <laughs> Uh, a couple months later, I ended up in, in court again, and there's this half-chewed <laughs> piece of paper that I had to explain. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, you, you're desperate. You'll, you'll do yeah. whatever you can. Do you want to talk about the court, which, I mean, I, there's many parts of this book that I think are, are great, but the, but the trial, uh, which is not the very end, but the getting toward the end, yeah. is uh, some, some really amazing writing. Do you want to talk about 
what that was like for you? Sure. Uh, so I was, on, I was on trial in what they call the Revolutionary Court in Iran. And um, I tell people that uh, if you ever find yourself on trial uh, in a court that's got revolutionary in its name, uh, don't expect a W uh, at the end of it. You know, your, 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 your verdict and your sentence has already been written long before you ever got there. Um, but I also understood that this was my opportunity, uh, really my lone opportunity, to give some real voice to myself and my own experience. Um, this was a propaganda uh, situation. The domestic news channels were there with their cameras, uh, trained on me the entire time, waiting for me to acknowledge you know, the smallest smidgen of guilt uh, that they would blast on their airwaves that night. I had seen Iranian state television for years. I'd seen scenes from courtrooms for years. I'd seen um, people admitting to things that they hadn't done before. So I was prepared. Uh, but, you know, I was in the courtroom of a guy named um, Abul Ghassem Salavati, which is a difficult name for most Americans to pronounce. So we just end up calling him the judge of death or the hanging judge because he's signed the execution orders of over 600 people. Um, and he was going to sign mine too. Whether or not that execution was ever going to be carried out, he fully intended to give me a, a death sentence. He told me so. Let, let's, let's be clear here too. This is, uh, it's not uncommon for there to be people executed in, in Iran, trial. Iran is the number one per capita executioner in the world. 900, Nine, in, in the year, in 2015 that I was in prison, over 900 people were, were executed. So, um, you know, my odds of winning were not very good. Uh, but I also knew that um, my odds of winning in the court of public opinion uh, were pretty high. And um, I didn't want anybody that ever saw uh, a second of that courtroom proceeding to A, think that this was a real court, mm -hmm. or B, uh, get the, the impression that I was um, copping to any guilt. Um, so it was a push and pull and struggle and, you know, I'm not the smartest uh, guy, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I was a lot smarter than my judge. You're and, very feisty uh, in the court. Yeah. I was surprised by that. And, and in, in your book you write, um, you write that something changed inside of me and I found a deep reservoir of indignation. And, and, you, and you say that's what helped you. Uh, act this way. You, you didn't have an, an attorney, really. You had a, a translator who was mistranslating, mistranslating yeah. your yeah. stuff, and you'd have to correct it. But you were, you know, you're you're really sp sparring with this judge. In a, you know, it's a very interesting scene. Yeah, I mean, I, I just I wasn't going to give an inch. That, that's the bottom line, and. Um, I think that, that indignation is a, is a powerful place to come from. Um, I know that acting out of anger uh, and frustration doesn't usually work for me, uh, but you know, kind of holding up a mirror to injustice uh, was something that I realized was available to me and I did it. And I'll do it again. You're not gonna get a chance to do that. Again. Do it for other people. Yes. Well, you are doing it for other people and my, Greatly appreciate that, and I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So, so there are a lot of interesting characters in your book, and I thought maybe what we do now is just uh, I'll give you a name and mm. give me what comes to mind, and and you can go a little further if you if you want, you know, just whatever you want to do. Yeah. So, um, Zarif, Mr. Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran. Ooh. Smooth operator. <laughs> He's a smooth operator. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot of good things to say about him. Um, also, in the book, and a big part of the book itself, Anthony Bourdain. I, 
I think for Yegi and me, he's our champion, you know? Um, a lot of people have seen the episode of Parts Unknown that we were on. Um, some people know that he was a big uh, and vocal advocate for us throughout our imprisonment. But after the fact, uh, after we were released, uh, he became a friend. And um, was an incredible source of advice and inspiration. Ultimately, I mean, uh, it's his imprint that published my book. And it wasn't because I only had one offer. I mean, there was a lot of people that wanted to publish this. But when Anthony Bourdain said that he'd like to do it, and we talked about it, it seemed like a no-brainer. Um, and I think you know, his death continues to be the hardest thing that's happened to Yegi and I since we got out. Can we time for a couple more? Or? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this, this, this person, to me, is the, my favorite character. Well, it, you don't say character in a memoir, but my favorite character in the book is Taggy Resign, your father. Yeah. I mean, I just... So much of who I am... You, 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 people tell you you become your parents, right? Um, so much of who I am is my dad. Even the way I kind of uh, stumble out of bed in the morning and you know walk with um, stiff joints uh, <laughs> reminds me of my dad. Um, he he taught me so much. Uh, he wasn't a perfect person in any way, uh, but like you said, he's a character. Can, can you please tell the story about the American flags? I mean, sorry, the rug. Oh yeah, sure. The, so my dad was a, a, a Persian rug merchant. He came to the United States in 1959, uh, 20 years before the revolution, and established a life for himself in San Francisco, met my mom, and um, opened up one of the per first Persian rug stores in that part of the country. And um, in 1979, when the hostages were taken at the US Embassy, um, his business ground to a halt. I mean, nobody wanted to buy something from somebody from Iran, let alone do business with yeah. an Iranian in any kind of way. And it didn't matter to people that he'd been there for 20 years. They just said, oh, this Iranian needs to go home. You know, he's, uh, he's not wanted here. And so it was a really tough time. Um, and when the hostages were finally released in January of, of 1981, after 444 days, uh, I beat them by 100 days. Um, uh, a lot of communities, a lot of people made gifts to the returning hostages. So, um, you know, Omaha, Nebraska sent steaks. Uh, Hawaii invited everybody for, uh, for a week-long vacation. Major League Baseball gave a ticket to every one of those returning hostages for life. Uh, I know some of the hostages, they still go to the game sometimes. Uh, and my dad offered uh, a Persian rug to each one of them. And of the 52 um, hostages, 40 something of them took my dad up on that offer. Um, How do you know that? I still have all the thank you letters from those guys. and I've. I've actually um, been to the home of, of one of those uh, former hostages. He lives in, in Falls Church, right outside of DC. Uh, and I've been there twice, and each time I've gone over, he's a man in his late 70s now. Uh, both times he took me over and said, this is the rug your dad gave me. And he flips it over, and there's a tag from my dad's shop, says, you know, resign Persian rugs. Um, so that, I mean, I think that, that was, um, the spirit that I went to work with in 2009 when I moved to Iran. And I hope that it's one that um, I continue to live up to now. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, yeah. and, and just to put the point on it, that these, these resigns, they did, the, they did the opposite things in their, in their life. And that Tegi comes from Iran, 
to the United States for his education, builds a life there, and in the process, Jason can't help but learn about his heritage. And then Jason, in his life later, goes back to Iran and lives there and is able to do it in part because of the osmosis of the lessons of the culture, right? 100%. And I think if, if I'm ever uh, fortunate enough to have a kid, uh, boy or girl, I'll go with them. If they want to go somewhere, I'm not letting them go anywhere alone. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I think Lynette is here, so I think we're going to take some questions from the audience okay. now. We are. Great. Um, there's a mic here if you'd like to go to the mic on either side. And while people are going to the mic, um, Netta Ulabi, one of our Knight Wallace fellows, uh, who's a reporter for NPR, has been following questions on Twitter, and she's going to ask the first question. This one actually comes from one of our fellow Knight Wallace fellows who wants to know if you believe, Jason, whether government should pay ransom for journalists, and I would add uh, media organizations as well, should they, should they pay ransoms? Was everyone able to hear that question? <laughs> the, the question was, um, does Jason believe that governments should pay ransom for journalists, or should media organizations pay ransom? I think we're living through extraordinary times when it comes to hostage taking. Um, and also in terms of how stories get amplified by social media and in the media. Um, I am not a proponent of, uh, of paying ransom, and I'm also not somebody who's an abolitionist who would say, don't pay any ransom, right? I think each case is an individual matter um, and I worry that uh, you know President Trump has talked a lot about his uh, his success at bringing hostages home uh, from other countries we've seen examples in Turkey Venezuela North Korea um, what we haven't heard about is what concessions were made in those cases he would have us believe that he just picked up the phone and said I'm the president of the United States uh, and the last president of the United States wasn't tough enough to get you to do this, but I can. That's not true. I don't know the details, but I can promise you that that's not true. So we have to think about that, first of all. Secondly, uh, when it comes to journalists, the same president has an incredibly bad track record uh, in protecting us. And uh, the horrible state of uh, journalist safety right now that we're experiencing uh, in 2018 is not caused by this president, uh, but he's exacerbating this problem. Um, so I, I don't have an answer, uh, a prescription on, on ransom. And as I was talking with uh, the Knight Wallace fellows earlier today, I think that there are three different types of hostage takings that we're dealing with. We're dealing with terrorist organizations, we're dealing with you know, pirates and other organized crime groups, and we're dealing with governments. And the prescription for each one has to be individualized. Uh, and almost, you know, when you're talking about governments, it's gonna be unique to each country that you're, that you're talking about. What I'd like to see happen is that states especially become de-incentivized de to doing this, because traditionally, hostage taking was something that terrorists and, uh, and pirates do. Uh, at a minimum, I'd like to get back to those days uh, <laughs> before we talk about um, if we should or shouldn't do something in particular to solve those mm -hmm. situations. We have a question here. Hi, Jason. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I'm wondering what your relationship was like with Iran as a place before this happened to you and what it's been like after. I know for a lot of people whose heritage is in the Middle East in these yeah. authoritarian places, it can be very painful, their relationship to your country. So I'm wondering how, what it was like before and after. I mean, I think for me, it, it was before, um, it was already a pretty fraught relationship. You know, I mean, I loved um, elements of being Iranian. I loved living there, uh, but I also hated living there. I mean, you know, it's a gender apartheid state. That's not something that as an American or as a human being, 
uh, I can really <coughs> accept. Um, at the same time, I wanted to spend time there. I wanted to get to know the place. I met my wife there. Uh, I made incredible friends there. Uh, I also knew that you know the way that we perceive Iran uh, is not um, whole. Um, my relationship has changed with it in, in some really significant ways. First and foremost, I can't go back. Um, that makes it a little bit um, more comfortable for me personally to talk about um, what I see as the problems with the place. Um, one really nice thing is the outpouring of support from uh, Iranians that, that I've gotten. More from people inside the country. I mean, I get mixed reactions outside the country, right? You know, some people like the work that I did there for years, some people don't. Um, but, you know, I get really kind messages from, from people that live there um, saying that, that I've done a good job of representing their, their concerns, and that, that means the world to me. Here. Uh, welcome to Ann Arbor, Jason. Uh, read your book and I loved it. Thank you. And I thank you for being here. Um, you're a young guy, and you may not uh, view this as a good thing, but many of the people who I've read about are heroes, people who we all know, Muhammad Ali, for example. The fight came to them. They didn't go after it. I'm very curious, uh, now having equilibrated back home, if this has given you an opportunity to do things for others that perhaps uh, other people without your platform could not do. And I'm very curious if you've had time with your family to think about big things that you may do. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, I, I, I never kind of sought out this kind of platform. I don't think anybody does. As you say, the fight is brought to me. Um, and I think that there's a couple of ways that I can be impactful right now. Uh, I'm still kind of, uh, you know, getting my legs strong again. Um, and the two things where I feel like I can be of particular help uh, are on the things that I know about. One, uh, the issue of being imprisoned uh, falsely in Iran, um, which is something that I write about and advocate on uh, pretty vociferously publicly, and also you know, behind the scenes when asked to do so. Um, the same is true uh, for press freedom issues. Uh, any chance that I get to highlight um, the plight of another journalist, I'll do that because other people did that for me. And um, I know that it takes, uh, it takes a, a, a village to get these stories out to the world. That's sort of the first sort step for me in this process. As far as bigger things, you know, I just want to get comfortable being back in the world again before I start to conceive of, uh, of, of bigger projects that I might undertake. Uh, but, you know, I had a choice when I returned home. I could either um, go back to work at the Washington Post, which was something that was offered to me right away, which I ultimately decided to do. Um, and that would mean embracing a fairly public life. Or I could have uh, kind of retracted from, from view. I chose the former, not the latter, and you know I'm kind of up for whatever comes with it. Netta, it looks like you have one more. Yes, can you hear me better now? Oh, yes. yes, I think you can. Were other family members or sources also threatened and harassed by, by the government? At the time of? That's right. Um, my wife, obviously, uh, and two other uh, Iranian Americans. One was a photojournalist. Uh, and her husband were arrested at the same time. They were released very quickly. Um, I think that there's a perception of fear that permeates a community when something like this happens. Um, and there's also uh, that, that fear of guilt by association, uh, which is a very real thing. Uh, but anytime 
I would hear these complaints while I was in prison uh, from my wife that, you know, my uncle won't call me because of X, Y, and Z. You know, they're afraid to call me. Uh, or I'm worried about what's going to happen to this friend of mine who was seen with us at a party. Uh, people make their own choices in life. I can't, I couldn't be put in a situation where I was responsible for everybody else. I, I couldn't do anything for anybody. Uh, and now, when I talk to people who have relatives that are uh, imprisoned, loved ones that are imprisoned there, I always tell them, hey, look, you know, the likelihood of, of, any, of your other relations being affected in very real ways by this uh, is slim. So, you know, if somebody's been in prison for a year or two and their relative says to me, we don't want to make a big deal about this because we're wor worried about uh, what's going to happen to our other family members there. I understand where that concern is coming from, but I always remind them, uh, it's your brother or your sister or your father that spent 800 nights in jail. Has anybody else spent a night in jail? And the answer is invariably no. So um, I'm not so worried about people's relations. You know, I'm worried about getting people out. The, I'm gonna, we're going to take a question here, and then um, I'd like everybody to stay in their seats. The question just before was about uh, Jason's work regarding press freedom, and we want to come back to close on that before we move out to the lobby for a book signing. But we're going to take one more question here before we do that. Hello. Um, thank you very much for coming here and sharing your experience with us. I'm from Iran. Um, as you know, um, Iran has gone through unprecedented uh, number of sanctions, um, uh, which uh, basically for nuclear program, um, which necessarily did not change the foreign policy of the government much. Um, my question is, um, as a kind of uh, determined, um, you recently asked for $1 billion uh, damage um, in order to deter uh, repetition of uh, taking hostages of uh, US citizens. Um, as we know, um, sanctions did not change much foreign policy, but it put a lot of pressure on um, fellow Iranians' life. Um, don't you think um, this, um, as a political move, is um, kind of implicit um, imposition or, or um, imp approval of um, putting more pressures on pressures on uh, Iranians that we love. It's a good question. I think uh, first and foremost, I've uh, made the decision a couple of years ago to take Iran to court for very specific reason. One, uh, because I was wronged by that government. Two, because there's a very specific uh, official version of events uh, that exists about my case, and it's the Iranian Revolutionary Court version, and I wasn't comfortable with that. And three, I want to deter them from doing this in the future. I think you're right that, uh, that sanctions have done little to deter Iran's activity in some ways, but it did get them to the point where they would negotiate. In terms of the, the judgment that, that I'm seeking, uh, there are very strong uh, frameworks about how that works. And the limitations of a judgment uh, are a small fraction of what I requested in that case. Uh, so if the judge were to decide that I was uh, in the right and that I should receive a billion dollars in damages, uh, the, the cap that I would ever receive on such, the, the maximum amount uh, is many, 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 many times smaller than that. So what is that money? That money is money that uh, the government of Iran is responsible for in the future. And it's my belief that at some point a government uh, will start to make right decisions if there is an outstanding bill in the world uh, that says to them, hey, you cannot re-enter the community of nations if you continue this kind of behavior. 
right? And there's ways to settle those claims, uh, but I do believe that, that it's a, an effective deterrent. It can be, uh, but you know, we don't know until, uh, until they stop doing this. Thank you for the good question. And thank you all for your questions. The, the question about the fight being brought to Jason is an interesting one. Um, and it was a fight that was brought to his family as well. And one of the things that's quite extraordinary about the book is the way it illuminates the efforts uh, his brother and his wife and his family went to to make sure that people, both people with influence and regular people knew about his case and kept his name out there and engaged uh, the organizing efforts and the advocacy efforts of people on his behalf. Uh, Bill McCarran got involved in Jason's case because Jason's brother Ali was relentless uh, in pursuing the National Press Club uh, and, and personally getting face to face with Bill and as Bill, tell, well, you tell it yourself, making you feel what it was like. Yeah, I mean, he, Jason said, you know, I met him when, I, when he came through the doors of the press club January 26, 2016, but I was introduced to him in late 2014 by his brother Ali, even though he was then thousands of miles away and, and behind a, a, a set of bars. You know, Ali made me understand what he was feeling, that, that his brother was in prison and that he couldn't, he couldn't get him out. He made me feel like, he made me feel what I would feel about that happening to say, my brother. And if any of you have a brother, you know, you know what that would be like. And um, I don't think he set out to do that. He just, He's a very interesting guy, and he, and he does work very hard. He's a great advocate uh, for Jason. But for me, he just managed to say things the right way, where I understood Jason to be a person, not a symbol. Um, and and, and that's, that was what was in my mind as I and my organization and other organizations were doing what we could to raise awareness. And, uh, and Bill's work, Bill has, I think, helped Jason find his voice and his role uh, in fighting for other people, other journalists who are in danger. And Bill helps a lot of us uh, who work, whose work touches on press freedom and safety issues. Uh, and many of you who follow Wallace House know that in our Knight Wallace Fellowship class this year, we have a U.S. asylum seeker. Emilio Gutierrez Soto, who is a Mexican journalist who um, faced death threats because of his reporting on military corruption. And uh, the threats in Mexico to journalists are very credible threats. Mexico is the most dangerous place in the world for journalists outside of active combat zones. Uh, in the past year, the conservative number is eight journalists killed for their work, and that's, I think, a very conservative number. Two journalists have been killed already this year in Mexico. One um, dumped in a ditch, a local journalist dumped in a ditch in January. And so anybody who follows Mexico knows that if your life is threatened because of your work, that is a credible threat, and that um, the people who are after you, whether that's the military or the government or the drug cartels, are likely to carry out that threat. And with nowhere else to turn, Emilio, uh, in 2008, crossed into the United States at a legal checkpoint and in the way that people are supposed to do it and presented himself uh, for asylum. And his case has been dragging along since then. In October of 2017, the National Press Club gave Emilio their highest award, an award that Jason also uh, is a recipient of, and it typically goes to journalists who, who have faced incredible danger for their work. And in receiving that award, 
um, Emilio spoke out on the practices of the U.S. government and the current asylum policy. At that time, he had never missed a scheduled appointment to check in uh, with DHS and ICE. Uh, even though many of those appointment requests were unreasonable, he never stepped afoul of anything that he was asked to do. But I think it's not a coincidence that after receiving that award and speaking out publicly in the United States in October of 2017, he and his son went for their regular check-in in El Paso, Texas, and were arrested and detained. Uh, and they were detained for nearly eight months in a detention center in, in El Paso, Texas. Bill and the National Press Club reached out to me as they were reaching out to many um, press organizations to see if we wanted to sign on to an amicus brief in Emilio's case. I went to meet with Emilio in the detention center in El Paso and on World Press Freedom Day, May 3rd of last year, I went to Washington to the National Press Club to sit on a panel with Yegi, Jason's wife, and others, and um, the Knight Wallace Fellowships, the University of Michigan, extended a spot in this year's fellowship class to Emilio. Uh, and we said his name <laughs> on this national broadcast, as people had said Jason's name many times. And uh, Jason, uh, Emilio and his son Oscar were released in July of last summer. In August, they came here to Ann Arbor, and they've been here with us uh, in the fellowship, taking classes at the university. Oscar, Emilio's son, uh, is working at Zingerman's, and Zingerman's uh, has been wonderful in welcoming Oscar into the program there. Um, and we've been waiting for a judge to make a ruling in Emilio's case. And last Monday, uh, the judge ruled against Emilio and ordered Emilio and Oscar to be deported. Um, and we've had many, many conversations in the, in the past week. Michigan Alumnus Magazine, who had been, which had been working on a story on Emilio, published a story on Emilio and, and, and his time here at the university and his quest for asylum um, that was published last week. And I had invited Bill here and Jason before this latest turn of events in Emilio's story. But as we were talking at Wallace House today, I think Jason reminded us all about the importance of, even when you're working tirelessly behind the scenes on a case, about saying the person's name out loud and making sure that, you, that people understand what's going on. And so Bill, I'd like you to just stand up and we're gonna have Emilio come up on stage um, for a moment. Um, you know, we can't do anything about the ruling right now. Emilio's lawyer filed for a motion of appeal last week, which f the filing of that motion protected them for the time being from being deported. Um, and so there are large things going on, but small things matter too. I think Jason also helped remind us of that. And so Bill would like to make a presentation to Emilio. Yes, Emilio. It's so great to see you. Thank you. We miss you, and we hope for the best in this case, and you will, you will, free, you will be free. At the National Press Club, we, we have 3,100 members worldwide. A select few of those are our honorary members. They're those that we, we invite to, to join our ranks. Um, Jason is one. Uh, people like uh, Marty Barron of the Washington Post and Dean Bacay. Can you hear Times. Bill in the back? No. You can't hear me, sorry. I think your mic has, has slipped. You can come here. Okay. 
I was saying that we have a practice at the National Press Club of, of honoring uh, outstanding journalists and making them honorary members of our, of our club, of our organization. Uh, and heretofore, they've been all US-based uh, journalists and many of the names and, and, and great companies that you would know. Uh, J Jason is one. And I mentioned Marty Barron and, and Dean Bacay, who are the editors of the Washington Post and the New York Times. And in that time, we, we, we've been around since 1908, and in that time, we've never extended this honor to an international journalist, uh, someone who's not a US citizen. And um, we want to do that today uh, for Emilio Gutierrez Soto. We want him to be uh, one of our group and to be one of that special group within our group. And so I've got a membership card for him today that I wish to present. And I invite you to demonstrate with your applause um, your recognition of his status as a journalist and that he is someone we very much look forward to welcoming as a, as a citizen of our country very soon. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Emilio. And thank all of you. Um, you know, we say at these events that we stand for press freedom. And I appreciate so much that you actually stood <laughs> for press freedom. Um, Jason is going to be going out to the lobby. We have our partners, Literati, here uh, to sign books and answer a few more questions. We also have, if you've seen members of the Wallace House staff here today, you'll see that we're, we're wearing buttons. Uh, one says, Free Emilio, and I don't have those here. But we have two other buttons that are going to be on tables um, out in the lobby. And they are very simple statements of our mission. And one says simply, Uphold democracy, support journalists. A very simple request. Uh, and the other statement is one that was uttered by University President Mark Schlissel at um, one of our events. And he said simply, simply, journalists, champions of the people. Journalists, champions of the people. And that is what the other button says. I thank you to all the journalists who are in the audience and on the stage. Um, and we'll see you in the lobby. Thank you very much. Yeah, you did great. You guys were great. Thank you all.